We are so lucky to have so many smart, innovative people on this planet. I mean, and, and, and you know, every one of you is really smart and innovative. You are, everyone is. Hu humans are, by nature. And the difference between us and them is they made it happen. I mean, seriously, they made it happen. So uh, I'm inspired. I, have, I was standing there thinking of the ideas the floating, that are floating around in my brain that I'm not actualizing. You all should jot those down, too. Imagine if we all did that. Um, so it is now my pleasure to introduce Terry Tamanen who um, I would say in California is something of a superstar in his own right. Um, he founded, oh gosh, I forgot, uh, one of the baykeepers, Santa Monica Baykeeper? Yeah. Oh, see, it's the end of the day and I still have it. Um, he founded Santa Monica Baykeeper. He was the secretary of the California Environmental Protection Agency, the uh, cabinet secretary for Governor Schwarzenegger, and many, many, many more things. Um, and so without ado, Terry. Thank you very much. I'm going to be very brief because I've got the great pleasure of introducing your closing speaker who is going to knock it out of the park here. Uh, but first of all, I want to thank the organizers. Uh, you know, Kareen Mandelbaum, who is, runs the, uh, now don't shake your head, who runs the Environment Now California Water Program at the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation, came to me many months ago and she said, can you believe that Jerry's Climate Summit doesn't have water as one of its pillars? We have to do something about that. And then she pulled a lot of other people together. Give everyone a great big round of applause, but especially Kareen. And all the other organizers that put in so much work and the funders and the sponsors, I want to thank you for doing this because how is it possible that water was not the first subject in a state that suffers? I mean, look, I don't have to tell you. I'm sure this has been part of what you've been discussing for the last day and a half. And, you know, again, I unfortunately wasn't with you the last day and a half, but I can certainly tell you that there's one reason, in my view, that this happens in addition to politics and money and, and all that sort of stuff. It's ignorance. It's eco-illiteracy. It's the fact that people think you turn on the tap, you turn on the shower, and that's where water comes from. And, uh, and so there's absolutely no solution to all the things that you've been talking about in the last couple of days that are all important, but there's no solution that's going to happen worldwide to our water crises if we don't create an eco-literate population and do it soon. And I'll give you an example. This is a true story. You can look this up. There's a president by the name of Donald Trump, I, hate, I thought I'd never say those words, but um, who, uh, who was, this is true, he was visiting a school, grade school, and he was bragging about the, the NASA space program, and he said, he said, we have a great space program. <laughs> we're going to land on Mars, and we're even going to land on the sun. And one of the kids raised their hand and said, sir, you can't land on the sun, you would die. And he said, without missing a beat, no, no, don't worry, we'll land there at night. <laughs> Eco-literacy, my friends, two words. So with that, as an introduction, and especially in front of so many distinguished eco-warriors, I'm sitting here looking at Mark Gold and Steve Fleischle and so many people here that have pioneered water policy and, and defended it in, in this country and especially in this state. So many great scientists, so many great policymakers, so many great people in business that are solving this. Uh, even my wonderful wife, Leslie, over sitting over there who's worked on eco-literacy, which is an important part of all of this. There's absolutely nothing that I can add to this discussion other than to apologize, which is to say that when I was EPA secretary and then you know, worked as cabinet secretary for Schwarzenegger and we got a lot of stuff done on climate, I'd say we made a lot of progress on climate, uh, certainly on clean energy, energy efficiency, on uh, toxins, on air quality, no question. Um, but the one thing that honestly, in certainly my time at EPA, and I would say in Governor Schwarzenegger's term, that went backwards was water. And, and you can measure that any way you want to. The total amount 
of water available to the necessary users, how much we were leaving in place for nature, for all the ecosystem services. By the way, speaking of eco-illiteracy, I'll give you one more data point, and this one wasn't just reported to me. This one I heard in person. Right after Trump got elected, uh, Leo and I went to meet him to try to see if we could influence his uh, at least climate policies and to show him that things that we wanted to do for the environment were also things that he could do for the economy. So we talked to him about energy efficiency, for example, 26 million streetlights in America that haven't been replaced with LEDs, but if you did, would save 70% of the energy, reduce that amount of pollution from that source of, uh, of energy production, and, uh, and pay for itself. And he said he liked that. He pointed out the LEDs in his Trump Tower office and, uh, and uh, the programmable thermostat. He said, oh, I like that. Let's do that. So we, we thought we had made a bit of a connection. We're talking to him about other things you could do that were good for the environment, but you wouldn't have to say climate change would also be good for the economy. In the middle of one sentence, he stops me and he says, wait a minute, you're from California. Wait a minute, you're from California. <laughs> um, he said, is it true that you let all the water flow into the ocean to save the tadpoles. And you know, you don't want to insult the guy you're there trying to persuade. So I said, well, I said, you have a little bit of that right. It's true, we do allow a certain amount of water to flow to, uh, to protect fish, but that includes the billion dollar salmon industry, which is important to feed people and employ people. And also when that water goes across those natural water courses, a lot of it percolates into the ground and refills the aquifers so that farmers and urban users can take it out later and use it. He said, oh, I didn't have any idea how that got in the ground. I always wondered about that. <laughs> Eco-literacy, my friends. And, uh, and I said, but, I said, uh, I'll tell you where there is one area where we shouldn't be throwing the water away. It's treated wastewater. We dump millions of gallons a day of treated wastewater into the ocean, and that could all be reused. In fact, in Republican Orange County, and he said he knew where that was. <laughs> Amazing. Um, doesn't know where Afghanistan is, but he knows where Republican Orange County is. In any event, he said, yeah, I know where that is. I know people there. I said, well, they have what was called toilet to tap, but it works, and they take that treated sewage water and they put it back to productive use. That's another thing your administration could do that would be good for the environment, help solve droughts. He goes, oh, okay, that sounds good. Again, of course, all that went in one ear and out the other. But no matter how you measure water, whether it is on getting better reuse, uh, watershed policies, uh, whether it's on conservation, whether it's on getting people to understand how climate impacts uh, water supply, I would argue that we went backwards. And, and that's the one area that I regret, and I apologize to those of you that are Californians. I failed. I can't say how well or ill Jerry Brown's administration has done since we left office, although I will say, isn't it interesting that water didn't make it into the main GCAS over there in Moscone Center? Well, I'll let that uh, be up to you to decide what that means. Um, but in any event, as I said, other than apologizing and giving you a few of those humorous anecdotes and, and advocating that the solution to much of this is eco-literacy, my real job here today is to introduce your closing speaker, who is one of those people that really doesn't need an introduction, which is why I could ramble on for five or six minutes. Um, but I will tell you this about Edward Norton. Uh, he is literally the smartest human being you will ever meet. He's not just a pretty face. He studied... <laughs> Uh, I mean, listen, I'd even go for him. I mean, he's, uh, <laughs> he's, uh, uh, he, he studied originally business and science and thought he was going to go into Wall Street. And uh, then his acting career took off. And of course, he became passionate about the environment. And he uh, uh, started up companies like Basswood that you heard about earlier and uh, a number of other initiatives to try to help the environment by supporting uh, uh, conservation groups and nonprofits, uh, starting nonprofits and working with water keepers. And anytime we pick up the phone and say we need his help, he is the first one to answer that call. It's like the bat signal. I don't know, we'll call it the Edward signal, the Norton signal. Um, but you know, when you pick up the phone and if any of you get the chance to talk to him later or if you get a chance to call him about an issue, just ask everybody else in the room to just shut up for a while and sit down and strap in because this guy knows what he's talking about. And he will inspire you, he will challenge you, uh, and he will amaze you. So please welcome Edward Norton. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I hate an introduction I know I won't live up to. Um, following Terry Tamman in a California-like environmental, uh, thank you. Um, following Terry Tamman with like conservation people in, in California is like going on after Dave Chappelle at the Comedy Cellar <laughs> in New York. Like there's, there's just no way. And, and then on top of it, he does comedy apparently. Um, that was a very good Trump, very good Trump. At the end there, he slipped into kind of a Dana Carvey-ish uh, mode. But, it, but the first round, I was like, whoa, it's really good. Um, the only, the, yeah, the only thing I think that's untrue in what you said about your story is, is in Trump is that he said, I always wondered about that. Uh, that, that rang very false to me. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, despite uh, Terry's introduction, I, um, for a little bit of context, I, I have this day job, um, but uh, my family business was always been in environmental advocacy. My, um, most of what I know, I know from my father and my brother and my sister. Um, my, di my dad was like uh, one of the early public policy directors at the Wilderness Society, and um, he founded the Grand Canyon Trust to take on water issues and power issues in the uh, Colorado Plateau, and he founded the Nature Conservancy's China Country Program, was over there for many years dealing with um, the, the, the watersheds coming off the um, Tibetan Plateau. And uh, my brother actually is a salmon fisheries expert. He, he ran the fisheries division at uh, EcoTrust um, up here in Portland, and, and my sister's an agronomist, a sustainable agronomist, so I'm like, I'm like, by far the, the black sheep, like, like lagging, the lagging tail of the, the family dog. And, um, but uh, um, I've, I've been lucky to work on community conservation and sustainable development projects in um, Kenya with an organization we started about 15, 20 years ago. Um, I've been on the board of great organizations like uh, Conservation International and uh, Enterprise Community Partners, um, which is one of the the largest developers of affordable housing and green affordable housing in the United States. And um, I've been serving as the uh, UN ambassador for biodiversity for a number of years now. And uh, as Terry said, I was kind of one of the founding investors, board members of Basswood, which Dan spoke to you about. Um, and uh, I, I, have, I have kind of gotten to journey uh, I have a journeyman's grounding in, in a lot of the effects, um, the, the ripple effects of our non-sustainable, uh, depletive, extractive relationships to this ecosystem that supports us and um, are being combated in different ways. And I am by no means as expert as Terry said or as the really, really impressive people who have spoken here in this room. But I do think um, I've had a unique privilege, which is to get to travel fairly widely in a lot of the circles of capital and uh, mission-driven work and entrepreneurialism. And um, I think that, I was, I was thinking downstairs about like what, you know, what helps wrap something like this up. There's been so many good talks about the specific challenges and specific endeavors, and it's worth maybe making a few macro observations. Um, I think uh, Terry got at this. I, I totally agree. Um, it's, it's actually st stunning to me what you said, that, that there isn't a water pillar in a, a global climate um, discussion. I think it, it's possibly obvious, but it's, it is amazing that our relationship to water, meaning, meaning we being the whole human community and especially the quote unquote developed world, is, is really uniquely ap apathetic, entitled, grossly negligent. Um, you know, we, we're hurting the, the ecological system that supports us in many ways, and yet we do we do ascribe value, both economic and emotional, to almost everything more than water. We we you know animals, landscapes, ecosystems, energy, atmospheric carbon, food. You know, literally almost everything has more of an emotional community of advocacy uh, around it uh, than water does, and water has been taken for granted as abundant and free, which, which really is highly ironic just given that we're made of 98% water and that, that you can live for weeks without food, you can live for um, 
forever without energy. You know, you can't live for 100 hours without water. Um, and yet most people probably think they couldn't survive without their iPhone for a shorter period of time than, <laughs> than they, they specifically kind of focus on water. Um, and I think, of course, you know, people in this room, we, we've had people who have rung that bell going, you know, Rachel Carson's in Silent Spring and um, farmers, communities that fall into crisis. But on the whole, we just don't prioritize it. We don't prioritize it even in the conversation and in the rooms where we're supposed to be talking about global environmental challenges. And that, that as a macro takeaway, that just has to change. It has to change. And it, um, uh, and now is, the, now is the time for that to change. And even, um, that, that's a narrative challenge, obviously, for everybody um, who's interested in the issue. And, you know, the funny thing is that even, even the Department of Defense knows this. They, they, if you talk to any senior military planners, they will tell you that they predict more conflict outbreak in the coming century as a result of water than any other natural resource. It'll be the, the next century, they say, will be the century of water wars. Um, that's their, that, that's a fundament in their planning at DOD. And you've got 90% of natural disasters water related. You have impacts of climate change on water being some of the most severe. N nearly half the demand of humans by 2030 for water won't be met. It's the principal driver of human health issues, water sanitation and lack thereof. So you're, you're heading toward two billion people as the victims of too much water and two billion people victims of too little water. And the, you know these are just staggering statistics. It's staggering that there's not a louder narrative uh, around this, um, and it's pretty daunting. Uh, so again, I think it's, it's, it's obvious but worth saying collectively within our, the noble work of these individual projects everybody's doing, we've got to collectively highlight the, the macro problem uh, more effectively. Um, in the way that atmospheric carbon has been highlighted, like like that, that is got uptake, and the water conversation doesn't have uptake. So that that I think um, is something to think about collectively. All, also, clearly you got to value water, um, uh, and there's been good talk about this. I th I think it's worth stepping back and noting there's you know there's been this fairly seismic shift. I, I think this is encouraging. Like. I mean, you could go, you could take it all the way back to John Muir, but even if you went to like sort of mid-century environmental activism around water, like Rachel Carson's and things like that, you know, the, the fundament of the environmental advocacy movement in modern times has, was rooted in arguing initially for the intrinsic value of nature and, and the spiritual value of nature, um, whether it was like David Brower fighting for the Grand Canyon as a cathedral of the natural world or... Um, people, the, the Wilderness Act, or things that had a protective or prescriptive measure with the idea of preserving nature, wildlife, as, as a, a value in its own right. Um, and an incredible amount of noble work. My dad's generation is, uh, you know, incredibly important work was done in a preservationist modality, but I think that, you know, in the 21st century, we have come into a confrontation with the fact that that arguing for the intrinsic value of nature is not an effective strategy. It has not worked. And the needs of 8 billion people are superseding any argument about elephants as an iconic macrofauna species or anything, no, nothing, or nothing in the argument for nature as, and its intrinsic value has, has been effective ultimately against the degradation driven by economic factors. And so, so natural capital, ecosystem service value has to be valued in, within the economic equation. It has to be, the, 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 this is a fundamental, essential shift in strategy that we have to value in the economic framework of our society and appropriately view, you know, so that, so that within national policy we have to make the argument that the only honest way to calculate GDP is to calculate natural resource capital internal to that equation if we want to have a sustainable future. And because we're seeing this bill come due, this bill is coming due that we haven't wanted to look at for 200 years. And 
we have to collectively be willing to say, we're going to internalize this, we're going to square up the accounts, or our children are going to pay it with loan shark levels of interest, you know, and, and, um, and that, th that is a necessity, I th and I think um, it is encouraging. To me, it's encouraging, exciting, because it's an argument that can be won. Like, fundamentally, that is an argument that can be won. Um, but where water's concerned, it seems to me there's actually still, it still lags, like water's the, the thing everyone really thinks is free. Um, and in every dimension of this work, the numbers have to be put to it um, uh, more than they are now. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it, in terms of hope, hope, it seems to me like the, the most, you know, the two big things, both of which are present in this room, are technology. Um, you know, when I, I don't really, I haven't really, I never really agreed with George W. Bush about almost anything, but, you know, and I think it was a little bit of a feint to say that, that, like, technology would get us out of these problems. But on the other hand, I think there is something to that. I think our innovation and, and the enterprise opportunity that's afforded by this crisis, the innovators that we've heard in this room, um, it's, it are wonderfully moving us into a, a deeper and a more holistic understanding of the natural systems that we've, frankly, like tried to replicate in much too reductive uh, and oversimplistic ways. Um, and I think that, you know, it's the people who were literally just up here. It's not even, you know, it's not even the dinosaurs of the, it's not Siemens and it's not like, you know, it's not these companies that are going to do it. It's like the people who are here. Um, and that's very exciting. And I think, um, I always think Bill McDonough is a friend and a mentor, kind of a legend to all of us. I always, I still think waste is a design problem is one of the great, great, great um, maxims of, of this era. And I think where water's concerned, as Terry said, like, you know, we, 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 we have wastewater treatment. It's not very good through companies like Basswood and such. It needs to get a lot better. But the notion that we let it go out uh, the system, you know, is so absurd. And um, actually, the, the mad scientist who is kind of the, the, the actual inventor of Basswood's technology, um, Paul Baskis, he, he said to me an amazing thing when I was trying to understand, like, why he thought um, wastewater was, design was a, a really big thing worth, ha worth hacking at. He said, you know, he said, we don't have a science. We don't have a problem of understanding the science. When a cow shits in the field, we don't get cellulosic sludge, and any first-year organic chemistry student can tell you why. We just have a systems management problem. That's all. And... Um, and I think that uh, it's, it's just really exciting to hear uh, the sophistication um, and passion of, of the innovators. And uh, obviously, the second biggest asset, I think, is communities, um, because nobody understands the threat of climate impacts on water like the communities that are directly affected by them, whether that's a Maasai pastoralist herder who's really feeling uh, the impacts of epic droughts on their cattle and degradation of their watersheds, uh, or a mother in Flint, Michigan. Um, and even in the absence of national leadership, you know, communities, small communities have proven that they can get very, very loud and force a lot of attention when it comes to water because water is so fundamental. That's kind of the painful irony is when people get loud about water, like even the Chinese government, you know, pays attention because they know it's dangerous for people to get really, really scared about water. So communities, small communities, do have the capacity to get loud um, about this issue, and that's exciting. And I think the takeaway in that, in both of those, that I, it, that I think is worth observing is that it, it, the most effective application of resources is in building community-based capacity. I think it's another lesson, I think, of the last, let's call it 50 years of the macro environmental movement is that, you know, every big NGO in the world learned that they were basically just pouring resources into the sand if they tried to get down in the weeds themselves and bring top-down dollars and top-down expertise. Uh, this was true in housing in the United States. It was true in 
environmental movements were wild. They, they realized like, that you've got to build community-based capacity. You've got to train and empower and fund people to work within their immediate local systems. Um, and foundations and corporate resources have got to continue to prioritize community-based partners and capacity over anything else. Like anything else, I think has proven the arrogance of it has been proven, and 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 the direction and focus of macro capacity should go toward community-based uh, partners and capacity building. And I think it is it is very exciting to see macro financial strategies, the World Bank, adding sustainable bond, uh, water bonds to the go alongside the green bond market, which has been pretty successful. It's exciting to see uh, my a mentor and hero, you know, of mine, Pavan Sukhdev, like, people love, you know, people people give actors too much attention, like, a actors love um, natural economists like Pavan Sukhdev. Um, I don't know, if you, if you haven't read his work, like, the Teab report that he, he led, uh, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, um, Pavan was a, a, he was the head of commodities trading for Deutsche Bank in Asia, and he said he got bothered by his daughter asking him, why some things were free and some things weren't, and he realized like they're not. And and the the Teab report is a really seminal piece of work, um, and it's it's worth checking out. Um, it really blows apart the canard that natural resources are or ever have been free, and I think it's um it's super worth checking out. These things are all exciting, but I think you know macro capital, philanthropic, and you know patient long term investment capital has got to go toward acceleration of tech innovation and toward community capacity building. And um, as great as it is to see, you know, over, what, 200 something people uh, signed up for this um, sort of sideline, it really, you know, this should be a conference of its own. It should be, it should be 5X as big, it should be 10X as big. And, and I think that um, if I can think of like an abiding kind of group collective commitment, it should be to, to grow the size of this room um, and, and push for this to have much more focus. Um, because I think, you know, the work people are doing in this room is heroic, but there are, are many, many, many more people that need to be engaged in this conversation. Um, and, um, and it's fun work. So uh, there's that, there's that too. Uh, that's it, that's all I got to say, but thanks a lot and thanks for being here.